I think probably we could get going, Amy. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Bring us back here. Hi, everyone. If you can see me, I can see you. <laughs> okay. Welcome okay. to the evening. Oh, look at you all. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna so I'll pin myself in for a second. I think that's the best way to go. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we've got a really exciting event happening tonight. Um, we're calling it a poetry reception event um, for Margaret Christakis's Dear Birch. Um, tonight we are joined by some special guest respondents who are going to share some of their thoughts on the text as well as um, read a little bit of their own material as well. Um, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Amy Dunn and I'm the publisher at Palimpsest Press. Uh, we are located in Windsor, Ontario, um, the southern tip of Ontario, where it is extremely hot today. <laughs> so hopefully it's not as hot where you guys are today. Um, this is a slightly different format than we usually do. So you are able to um, turn your cameras and your microphones off and on. We are going to ask that you keep your microphones off until the end, till the um, question and answer period, when you will be invited to raise your hand and um, join in and ask your questions directly to Margaret, um, which is why we've, or to any of our panelists, which is why we've we've done it this way. Um, we also welcome you to go and rename um, yourself if you'd like to add your pronouns. Um, you're invited to do that as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to either me or Margaret via the chat at any point in time. Um, if you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A period, you are welcome to send me a, a message letting me know, and then I can you know, let the panelists know at the end that you have a question for them. If you do use the chat, please be respectful of Margaret and all of the panelists. Um, and you know, let's use some polite language, basically, is all we're asking for today. Um, and lastly, I'm just going to do our um, land acknowledgement. Palimpsest Press sits on the traditional territory, um, the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which is comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight, and I am going to turn it over to Margaret now, who is going to introduce you to the panelists. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Let me say it's been a real pleasure to work with Palimpsest, and uh, to help make this, this baby come into the world. Um, we, we managed to uh, bring Dear Birch out in the spring and um, had a wonderful press launch, but uh, I really felt like I wanted to create a context to um, open up some sort of conversation, which is what I feel most uh, you know, sort of stimulated by when it comes to interacting with other people's writing is to understand more about how it sort of impacts and roots itself in, in their own writing process. Um, before I go too much further, I just want to say that um, Amy has been wonderful to work with and I work with my editor, Jim Johnston uh, through the press and I'd like to thank Jim. Um, that was a great process and um, And I'd like to thank um, Maureen Hines and Stephanie Bolster, who were early readers of, of the text and who provided blurbs for the book, which is uh, a kind of readership and you know, involvement in the text that, that is much appreciated. Um, tonight, I'm coming to you from Toronto, a place I've lived for 35 years. And I'd like to acknowledge 
This land where I make my current home is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Tonight, I have five wonderful guests. I want to pass on the apologies of Shannon McGuire, who uh, unfortunately was not able to make it tonight. Um, send my love to Shannon. Thank you so much for taking part in the process uh, of responding to the book. And I'm sorry that you're not with us tonight. Um, certainly um, very excited to hear what, what you've put together um, privately. So tonight we have five readers that I'm, I'm uh, really thrilled to, to share with you. Um, and tonight uh, the reading order will be Sally Ito, Lida Nosrati, Carrie Manders, uh, Jimoke Verasimo, and Muzia Basirkiev. Um, that's quite a lot of content. Each of these wonderful readers will uh, share with you about eight or nine minutes uh, comprising their response in, at, in some way to Dear Birch and um, linking that in some way, uh, in some cases to, to a piece of their own writing. So, you know, stick around. That's, uh, I, I'm so grateful for, for what we're going to hear tonight. But I want to start actually um, with just a few thought experiments. Um, we've been living in a Zoom universe, a distanced universe. Dear Birch was largely written under a condition of solitude uh, three years ago, far, far before the pandemic. And um, I have found that in the Zoom environment, it helps to sort of take take stock a little bit and sort of situate ourselves. So I'd like to just ask you to sort of take note of your body and your bearing in some sense at this moment. Um, think a little bit about where you're sitting, what your environment is, what materials are around you, what are the objects and commodities that you consider to be your own around you? And, and then what is the root structure if there is any that connects your body to any natural green space from where you are now. Um, can you think of this, this connectivity between us as a kind of root structure that reflects our own nature, um, I guess is a, a secondary prompt. And now I'd just like to invite you to do a bit of a private sound audit where you can connect with your own breathing your own pulse, your appetites, your willingness to listen tonight, and then to move into cycling around yourself, sort of in concentric circles, maybe from the body outward, away from the body, noticing just some of the sounds you can hear in your environment, simultaneously with the voices that are present. And now I'll ask you to consider in your own memory, a tree or a bush or a meadow or a vine or even a chopped down trunk somewhere that you value and feel connected to. And I just invite you to think about that tree or meadow or being as we get going. Dear Birch was written within a time frame of a three year grieving period that I felt after my mom died in 2015. And the writing in the book was composed in a nine day writing cycle in, the, in August of 2018. So I'd just like you to consider a measure of three years, how it exceeds this pandemic, how there's almost as much before the pandemic as the pandemic, and to, to weigh how you hold such a measure in your own life. It's been three years since the writing of Dear Birch. So now it's six years. Um, and what I've offered in, in the text is a kind of open-ended time realm for continued mourning, which is a kind of experiencing the continuity that we have with those we've lost. I'm just gonna read uh, one piece from, from Dear Birch, and then we'll begin the the sharing from our guests.
August 20th. When writing returns to her solitary mind without precipitative audience through social media, she feels little. She feels confused, imagines forward to a reader if and when these phrases are lifted into a public space. She is unmoored, she's on hold, missing all the pleasures of feeling instantaneously read that are intense and addicting. The congratulatory recognition of all the flickerish signs of being influential, the hearts, the check marks, licorice comments, the thumbs up, giving a chill sense of being seen at work by colleagues, a forum so completely missing in the larger timescale of writing labor. But maybe there's a whole battery of questions she's not asking of herself, a way of thinking about the text she is making. And then, aha, she falls away to mindlessly checking Facebook and Twitter, refocusing, gathering into her senses. Naming and transcribing the sounds she hears, the social processes in play, the neighbor's tenant laughing and cooing on her cell phone on the fence's other side to the right, the woman named Elle adjusting and hoisting the baby's double carriage to the left heard across the fence, social witness and Congress of a different kind, her awareness and mapping of the weather, the movement of leaves on your slightly swaying branches, dear birch, Flickering of shadow and sunlight, shoot exhaust of the coffee toast roastery air conditioner, her hair unfurling from a self-coiled bun sliding like a squirrel tail onto the back of her neck. Voices from the brewery employees across the lane and eastward, a more distant scrape of shovel and women's laughter, a rising jangle of cicada song or physical friction, however they make this strange electric buzz as a colony all at once. Nearby smooth suction of a door into its frame, the metal stopper engaging. Quiet, dormant, eternal black cell phone gleaming on the patio table in front, a book she's awaiting to return to, secondary pencil and calendar, her coffee cup, her numb, buzzing fingers gripping the pen she holds, so like the cicada sound, sensation nervous in her, jostling accoutrement. Her neighbor now sitting almost silent except for fork tines or scoop of spoon tapping a ceramic bowl or plate, indicating she is quietly eating, maybe reading as well, perhaps noticing her figure as a collage of visual shapes through her peripheral view of the neighbor's yard. This patio and you, dear Birch. Inside the house are two of her adult children, one in the basement adjusting sound levels, making music out of beats, beats out of music, and one upstairs working, typing, planning, cataloging her extraordinary photographs, moving in her many directions at once. Inevitably now, she gets agitated, checks online again. Instead of this writing, she begins to crave reading, considers books she has been reading, Camilla Gibbs' This Is Happy, Roxanne Gay's Hunger, Maria Much's Know the Night, her friend Victoria Freeman's manuscript Mourning Her Sister with Down Syndrome, Vaclav Havel's essays, all first person narratives except for Solnit's brilliant bio of Moybridge, but even that strangely driven by the writer's interest in making sense of Moybridge's life, inner and outer, in random. In tandem. <laughs> Staying with the writing process is hard. Years ago, she would have written 10 or 12 pages all about her feelings. Now she can only write when her feelings are dispensed with. She just walks or sits with her feelings. She rides a bike with her feelings. She knows they're tempestuous and vacillating. This leads her to search the word changeable and consider vocabulary for this idea of how her feelings shift and transform into others, how she becomes so associated with one or two weirdly sutured and has to wait for the system to permute to another especially feelings of pain, loss, desire, wishfulness, refusal, yearning, over-attachment. She has to wait to let it shift to a more flexible, less attached investment, especially in the love object. So much life work in this gradual unhinging. So thank you very much. Um, 
how are we doing? We're fairly, fairly on schedule. Now I'd like to introduce three of our guests who will then uh, share their, their writing with us. Thank you so much for being here, all of you. Sally Ito is a writer and translator living in Winnipeg. She has published three books of poetry, Frogs in the Rain Barrel, Season of Mercy and Alert to Glory, along with a collection of short fiction, Floating Shore, and translations of Japanese poetry for a children's picture book. In 2018, her memoir, The Emperor's Orphans, was published by Turnstone, quote, from the shadows of post-war Canada and Japan to the vast Canadian prairies of the new millennium, Ito explores cultural identity through movements of place and voice, recounting a tale of journeys to and from Japan and Canada, and discovering family secrets that reveal the effects of war on her family's lives and identities as Japanese Canadians. She teaches creative writing at Canadian Mennonite University and has mentored young writers. I think Sally and I met when we were on a Canada Council jury about six years ago. Lida Nosrati is a literary translator. Her poems and translations of contemporary Iranian poetry and short fiction have appeared in the Capilano Review, Prism, Words Without Borders, Matters of, Femin uh, Matters of Feminist Practice, and elsewhere. She has received fellowships from the Banff International Literary Translation Center, Yaddo, Santa Fe Art Institute, Witter Binner Poetry Translation Award, and Breadloaf Translators Conference. She lives and works as a legal worker in Toronto. We've known each other here in the Toronto writing community for a number of years. And Carrie Manders is a Toronto-based writer, editor, and photographer. She contributes to the New York Times, T Magazine, The Advocate, and Aperture, among other publications, where she explores various aspects of queerness, mourning, and photography. Her first collaborative chapbook with Brandy Ryan, After Pulse, was published by Knife Fork Book in 2019. And her second with Tom Cull, Keep Your Distance, was published by Collusion Books recently in 2021. She is currently writing a morning memoir. Carrie and I have been friends for more years than I can enumerate. Uh, fabulous friend. So I'm just gonna welcome uh, Sally first and then following on, uh, you'll hear from Lita and then Carrie and then I'll be back. Um, so take it away, Sally. Hi everyone, thank you, uh, Margaret, for inviting me to this event. I'm coming to you from Winnipeg, which is the traditional land of the Oji Cree, Anishinaabe, and uh, the Métis. And I want to say that um, it's a pleasure to meet everybody. And I'm going to, I, I, I loved Margaret's book. Um, and I'm going to actually read a letter addressed to Margaret Mm -hmm. um, as she had dressed the birch tree in her book. And I'm going to be taking sections uh, that kind of formed this letter and formed me thinking about the book. Dear Margaret, August 24th. I first read Dear Birch while at a family camp at Star Lake in White Shell Provincial Park in Manitoba. It is July, not August, when I read it, but I am brought into its time and place because I too am a diarist and as such want to remember thoughts and events I have lived, especially the delicate events and contradictory thoughts I perceive myself to be hearing and watching. <laughs> at this camp, at this moment, your words, Margaret, make me think of the birch tree up the gravel road from the camp that stands white fleshed in a stand of boreal forest, so obviously birch, its white bark, so like papyrus, so wanting of words to be written on it. It's true, Margaret, that the birch greets me without sound, and in turn, I am perennially vibrating like a white mammal with a matte soft coat or the memory of shark airborne. And I come to think, like you, that writing, when I really feel myself to be, 
writings sucked straight from the inner chamber of my thinking about what I see, hear, detect, gather, and bring into relationship is true. For now, that innocuous white birch on the gravel road for which I would never have thought anything of has through your writing connected me to you. Your writing in me inspires a project. I will make friends with the birch. I will bring your words to it. I will take your book, your words, the cover which reads Dear Birch and place it at its feet, an offering. And I will take a photograph or make a video on my phone. I do that. Such a project makes me happy and focused. I feel like a character in a book I loved as a child. See, with a writer, it always goes back to the book. The character's name is Moomin Troll. Do you know him? Now, I study the birch as you have, and note as you do, it's two white bark that peels from its core, its paper-skinned nature. No mere description, your words morph as metaphors do, making unlike things into like things, you into birch, birch into you. I need hear myself think to bring my own being into language. I take a photo and video of dear birch at the foot of the birch on the gravel road and share it with you, Margaret, and make it into a TikTok video later for this event happening tonight. It's not the same as someone reading your book, but digital platforms are shout outs to friends and followers, some of whom are readers and might want to read your book. For does not every writer hunger after the reader? The digital is not the same as words in a printed book. One's reading of the text in its tactile form and watching a video capturing the essence of the words in a moving image are different. Still, the video is a reconfiguring, a reinterpretation that is its own form of celebrating a person's words. While reading Dear Birch, I feel how true your list of why memoir appeals to you now. For personality, movement of specific mind in specific circumstances, for voice and experiencing of, of hearing the elongated speech act, for continuity, a movement of consciousness and the sense of the body being physically located in real and persuasive spaces, for representation of how life is an amalgamation of the self experiencing new encounters and therefore inventing new narrative testimonial about experience. And how you teach me things in only the way books can, by having me interact with your book in this exercise of being together in community to talk about your book, savor its words and delight in its rhetoric. You make me less passive, activate me with words, with calls and invitations to participate in your world of words in an event you orchestrate, which is much better and more fun than me sitting in a chair, listening passively to your voice. You are an artist and you have called me a fellow artist into your circle of creation. And I'm grateful and challenged. Nothing in this text is beneficial. I disagree, at least for this moment, this now of my saying. So, dear Margaret. Thanks, Margaret. It was great fun interacting with your text. Sorry for my panting dog, <laughs> if you can hear him. I love that we can hear him. 
And or her, uh, actually. <laughs> her. And th thank you so much. So I just, I'm going to just read one poem from uh, my book. This is Alert to Glory. And um, your book is about memory um, in part. And so I'll just read this last poem that I had in Alert to Glory, which is about, um, about memory. Nostalgia. I tunnel of memory, tracking like searchlights, morsels of time to prey on. When caught, the moats are illumined and become snowflake sharp, tines like knives, crystalline, caught in a beaker solution of gaze and absolve. When like two doves, memory and word, they settle on a portion of still time, they become feathered nest, a place for the soul to repose, egg-like in its charm. Everywhere such sight alights, it wishes to linger, but cannot. As flight in birds is natural to creatures feathered and winged, so too the human longing for hidden time in which a moment might hang, an ornament of grace, a diamond in the air, waiting like fruit to be plucked and savored. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sally. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Margaret, for this gracious invitation uh, to be to be part of this conversation with, with your book. It was a true pleasure. Um, I'm going to uh, read a, a brief text, which sort of is an introduction uh, to some other texts that uh, were in, invoked by uh, this conversation with Margaret's. A book and some of them older texts that I actually revisited. And uh, speaking of archiving, I thought I would never see these uh, poems again. But you know, the uh, reading your book, Margaret, made me want to go back to them and uh, and uh, actually look at them as a reader again, as uh, with this distance. So thank you for that. On non-enduring narratives, someone I once held in love told me about a tree in their father's backyard in El Paso, Cochabamba, a lemon tree whose seeds I transplanted in a pot in this city, hoping to resurrect the trees held and lost in memory. The Japanese pear tree in the backyard of my parents' home in Fagih Mahalle, a home that is no more. And the photo of my mother underneath, her eyes averted from the camera because of glaring sunlight or lack of patience with the photographer, most likely my father. I would never know. On muddled memory, the film director whose name escapes me now. He dedicated one of his films to his father, calling him the old oak because as kids, they measured themselves against him and he would always be higher, taller, wiser. On naming, normal willow versus weeping willow versus bide majnun, lovelorn willow. Mm -hmm. On grieving loss, when leave taking is happening without one's consent. Why does this remind me of crying in public or urban fruit trees whose branches fall in legally public domain? On the parallel sentience of being in womb, lovemaking, the one I now hold in love called us, the readers tonight, the tree people. On languages meeting, like every attempt in documenting, this too began with translation, in translation. What are you, dear Birch, in the languages I hold? Epistle 1. 
It's six in the morning, and I envy the number of syllables in your name. Crows open the day by breaking into a subsong, and I, by knowing our cities are twins by way of one official decree or another. That water boils at 88 degrees Celsius in one, and alleyways are named after martyrs in another. An artless plaque with a picture, first and last name, date of birth, place of death, and name of operation. This only if you want to indulge the one who walks by. It's six in the morning and I learn that Iliac Crest harvests life, clinically and otherwise. Epistle two. To the rain that witnessed every word you spoke and documented it in good faith. To the limitless lanterns of white magnolia that lit the street corner simply and studiously. To the tears of cherimoyas, to the honeycomb, to the two women hard at work in the kitchen, this feast of noise and clutter and plea, this lure of loneliness out into the night, this constant feat of contradiction that you forgive and forgo every time. Epistle four. A year ago today, I wrote a novena about my mother's hair. You asked if I'd read it to her. I said I most likely wouldn't because I have to translate it into Farsi and it would lose its force, assuming it had any in the first place. I said sometimes I think I'm betraying those I love by writing in a language they'd never be able to read. You said sometimes we love better in another language. I said, let's not inflict ghazals on each other. And today, all I want is the unhinged benevolence of a tongue, any tongue, to ease the pain of what is soon to become archival material, a memory, an absence, a lack. Today, I'm the one who takes everything lyrically, things including, but not limited to, to the framed, be amazing, on the wall of the dimly lit room at the corner of Saint-Denis and Carré Saint-Louis. To this day, I can't tell if this was a wish or a command. The grocery items lined up by the person in front of me in the checkout line, that most vulnerable declaration of intimacy between perfect strangers. The divination to Ha Jin and not Ha Fez on the longest night of the year. Can a body run out of tears? What is the last sense to go when we die? Epistle five, some protest to daylight saving by signing petitions, others by not turning the clocks forward or back, by asking which time you are talking about when you talk about old or new. To keep things simple, I ask that you be the holder of time. I've seen you tying up the sun to the earth with your right hand. I've seen you staying and leaving at the same time, the way a mountain does. And I only know how to count the scars on your body. I think I'll end here. I'm not, I lost track of time, sorry. That was so beautiful, Lita. Thank you. August 24th, or fretwork, after MC. Dear Birch, I write, and already am into the question of naming and the difference, the gap between the written and the spoken word. Dear, dear Birch, then, the double dear you can hear and double comma harder for the ear, clarifying my act in speech. I apostrophize MC's text, not tree, though they have everything to do with one another. Dear might signify direct address, might be a term of endearment, might mean we're diving into an epistolary missive. Dear sounds animal-like. The difference is a letter. Dear, dear Birch, you sound, resound, shudder, and shiver in multiple directions. 
the space between one comma and its other is the time it takes to notice you leave us hanging like a leaf. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, so much depends upon Sejura. <laughs> Dear Birch, a text signed and sung by Margaret Christakos, she who records sensations and dreams and thinking on and with the date. Dear Birch, another way to say Dear Diary. By definition, Diary names the ontological primacy of the present and its writing subject. In practice, a different story unfolds. Diary is always already memento mori. I read her dates, make something of them my own. A date doesn't belong to any one of us, repeats year after year. A date is always subterfuge, naming a now crisscrossed like latticework with future and past dates. That might be a definition of editing. It's August 24th, 2021. Today, I attend to MC's August 24th, 2018 by attending this spread of reader writers. In 2015, her mother died. On May 19th, 2020, my mother died. If your mother dies, you are invited to grieve for three years and forever. If there are two things I've learned about writing from reading MC with and among others, it's that one, writing is always about your mother. Two, writing is always about your mother dying. Three, a text will always whisper how to read it. But when? The perennial question of chronology and its disruption. Why does August 19th through 28th follow August 24th? And on August 27th, we read an older MC poem dated 2009. Self-citing, MC dates herself. Time travels between one book and the next. What follows MC's body of writing, her body writing, are complex accumulations and deviations. The time between one book and another, a handless clock, a, sp a space of breathing being, and then? open Dear Birch to see August 24 take precedence. First, after all, is the diary fragment most explicitly about writing as such, about MC at work, articulating her longing to remember thoughts and events so as not to lose their trace, to hold on to remains of her days. On August 24th, 2018, she sat at an iron patio table on Ivy Avenue, writing beside a birch tree. On August 24th, 2021, I sat at a wooden picnic table in Monarch Park, writing beside a different birch tree. There are many names for tree. There are many trees for birch. Later that day, by which I mean now, I'm here at this virtual round table, wondering at gaps between us and the astral nature of language. Gaps never closed are celestial playgrounds, what she might call an open fretwork of containment, hallowed holy ground that leaves us grasping, gaping. To read MC is to watch her unfold in time, unspool in being, Visible seams of language holding pieces together. Press them. Do they seem to tear? She keeps trying and trying aches in ways that still need naming. Naming, like mourning, is always to come. Her writing is improvisation, a pursuit that moves left to right and back again, recording states of being, her own and others. MC's pen moving is lyrical liftoff, akin to flying a kite and running alone. And yet, and yet, there's always the ear of the other waiting to hear. Writing is urgent desire. The paces and textures of composition are already decomposition, erotic and deathly, or should I say deadly? Her phrase fragments are wet broken things, lucky to have survived at all. The ink spills, survival is orthographic erotics, ongoing. A diary entry is a door, an entrance, an exit, an interval between one day and the next, 
one year and the following, between the writing and the editing, the publishing and the reading, the response and the round table, where we keep trying because ways still need naming and mothers still need mourning and practice makes practice. Dear Bert is also MC at practice. What is dear? When is Birch? Who is Margaret Christakos? How is mourning? All matters of some gravity. Margaret Christakos is attached to this earth. We've heard that before. Beyond attached to this earth, she is its digger, climbing not up the tree, but ascending downward underground to uproot meaning, disinter remains. I say ascent downward because we ordinarily believe that descent is easy. The writers I love are descenders, explorers of the lowest and the deepest. MC is a surveyor of unnoticed depths, impossible and unavoidable things that slip through fretwork. Open the door. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Wow. Let me now introduce Juma K. Verissimo and Marusia Bosyerkiev for our next set. Juma K. Verissimo is the author of two poetry collections, I Am Memory, 2008, and The Birth of Illusion, 2015 which was nominated for the 2017 NLNG Nigeria Prize for Literature. Her latest work, a novel called A Small Silence, 2019, won the I Do Cinder Prize in 2020, awarded by the Women's Caucus of the African Studies Association for an outstanding book that prioritizes African women's experiences, and was also shortlisted for the Andache Prize in 2020. Jumoke's works are widely anthologized and some of her poems are in translation in Norwegian, Italian, French, Macedonian, among others. She was a Chinua Achebe Center Fellow, Kwani Kenya, in partnership with Bard College in 2012 and has worked as a freelance journalist. And in recent years, Jumoke has returned to academia for a PhD at the University of Alberta which I think I mentioned was where we met during my residency there in 2017, um, 2018. And our fifth reader will be Maruzia Basirkiev, who is a filmmaker, author, and academic obsessed with archives, memory, and food, which is also an archive, she reminds us. She is the director of 10 films, author of six books, including most recently, Food Was Her Country, The Memoir of a Queer Daughter, her most recent documentary film, This is Gay Propaganda, LGBT Rights and the War in Ukraine was screened in 12 countries and translated into three languages. Her books have won and been shortlisted for several awards, including the Kobzar Award, Lambda Literary Award and Independent Publisher Award. A longtime organizer and activist, she is co-director of the Studio for Media Activism and Critical Thought at Ryerson and is currently working on a fabulous new documentary called Before Hashtag Me Too the story of a feminist media revolution. So um, welcome, Jimmy Kay. Uh, Jimmy Kay, can you unmute? We can't hear you. <laughs> oh my. Now you're here. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, I enjoyed re reading Dear Birch. It's such a lovely book. And um, it's brought, took me through a journey. I, I, I consider it a kind of spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading here from Edmonton in Alberta on a part of the Metis Nation Region 4 land, which serve as a meeting place for indigenous people such as the Cree, the Blackfoot, the Métis, the Nakota Sioux, and Ojibwe, and the Inuit. Um, 
So when I read the book, I read it in the order in the, which the book is structured first. And then I read it in the order of the dates, 19th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th of August. The dates of August 24 and 27 are significant in my reading because they eliminate my reading of self in the book. The first meeting is on August 19. She meets the tree. The recognition of competing beings around her, yet the knowledge that she has found a soulmate. As she says, your special vitamin is a quiet patience. She writes, as a reader, I am reminded once more that there is no greater penetration than a tree's gaze. She sees, it sees, and that trust is largely a matter of concession. I'm thinking of commitments, of trust. I proceed to August 21st and 25th. Communication. How is an exchange possible between two beings miming solitary, solitude? Birch as a rhythm of stillness, she as a writing, and it is here that she draws inspiration, telling me to read the significance of learning to listen and be still in a world of distractions. Social media spaces where nothing holds true for sociality, except those echoing anxieties that distract from the words that need to be written. However, it is in addressing the audience of focus, addressing me to be attentive to this now dear birch that is hers, that is mine, that it works for a foundation, for rootedness, to move away from a remote seeming gaze emerge. Dear poets, I merge with you, for as you write about being physically located in real and persuasive spaces, a representation of how our life is an amalgamation, I merge with you. And this amalgamation is an awareness that writing is no longer about tapping into emotions and letting them run free, but about remaining awake and seeing that the, what is no longer there, what is no longer invoking presence, presences on the journey into the many emotions that can't be told is now with our dear Birch. While August 21st was a journey for you into healing and a request for direction, I journeyed with you into August 23. I'm with you, the poet. I'm with you, poet. And I've also learned to trust the friendship of a birch. So when the poet says she has become aware of how present she is with her body, and she begins to hear the direction of her life in the imagined, when she says two relationships mostly imagined, epistolatory, giving her address a direction, how right does she tell me how much my focus struggles to tell secrets to trees, how much I fail to listen? Again, the tree, our relationship with the tree weaves a web of relationships, reminds me of my broken relationships. Into the life she, she, into, she tells of the life she acknowledges, but I'd previously ignored. I'm reminded of mine. As intimacy and trust develop, an awareness of our relationships as belongings to and belonging to her emerges, as does a profound responsibility for where disconnections and real connections occur. I emerge. There are also moments of gratitude, appreciation, joy, and fear in the spaces of solitary reflection, all of which are centered on loss. Dear poet, I'm traveling in the multiple losses that ask me to wait to listen and to make friends with a tree. Are you teaching me to, to talk to a birch? August 21st and 23, baggage. There are relationships prior to dead, dear birch, and some are forming formations that seek new structures. I read again that it is a tree that serves as a reminder of how we root into, out of, and away from relationships in order to see ourselves emerge. To be read by a birch and to respond to converse, to report, 
to relay all the untold details of one's life is to have a sense of clarity, to find a way to model nothing. As you write, here, as she writes, in encounters that are anonymous and singular, somehow she explains they are not intimate, whereas their, their connection is intimate or was intimate. The hierarchy has appealed to her and made sense. I feel strong st friendship here, but there's also the fear of losing the tree, which is perhaps a metaphor for the fear of losing oneself, of, becom of becoming someone without representation. Is this how else you learn to read your own truth into mine? So that if you do not listen to the tree, tree rustling and observing the wind, do you also teach me to listen? Will you also teach me to listen to the earth? When I read the poem on August 20, oh, when I read the poem August 22, I can almost feel, I could almost feel the vibrating leaves attending to the evolving life of a friendship formed through the discovery of a soul, a bark, a tree a reflection on the measure of memory of a life reconciling beingness and emergence from the wind, from the tree, from the being, from the departed presence of all lingering embraces of formative bonds. As she writes, wind moves certain like thinking. Wind can seem to be absent, but it returns just as. The wind is aware and also taking its own notes. I read August 27, 2009. The collections only date with a year. Leaves me wondering, what, did he, what is it about August that transforms the birch into a companion? A perennially listening deciduous object that transforms into a conscious epiphany, epiphany of self-recovery, a path to rediscovery. Additionally, this poem has a different font. It demonstrates how in conjunction with the other poems, it represents a desire for companionship. It tells me about a deep yearning for the beauty of bitterness to be appreciated. It tells me about the aesthetics of loss. It is a cry for translation of the screaming vibrations, the ache beneath, beneath the arc of a tree, the understory yearning for an eternal strand of a relationship. Dear poet, I'm connected. By August 28th, the journal has witnessed the disintegration of the reader into a mutual relationship. I transcend your pain. I know your burden. I'm flying with the wind you felt. Perhaps there's a recovery. Like you're right, there's less bitterness in her voice today. When she listens, she's listening beyond it. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I enjoyed reading, reading. It's a wonderful work because solitude has always been something that um, my latest novel is on a solitude between a, 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 a former professor and um, and a girl who comes to visit him. So as I read, there's a sense in which I, I, I had to journey back into the, the need for attentiveness, you know, that constant, how we lose ourselves in a world where we are constantly snatched away by so many things, of so many sense of distractions. And that, that conscious attempt to let every word take us back to where we lose ourselves, I mean, matters a lot to me. So I think I'll stop here now. I think I've taken too much time here. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you so much. So thoughtful. Dear Birch, written on Ivy Avenue, where I've lived for 12 years, out of the corner of my eye, I can glimpse the birch tree when I walk the brick lane that is Wagstaff Avenue behind Ivy, loving the book's locatedness, its affection for all things proximate, 
its celebration of the unruly industrial sounds of my neighborhood. I'm gonna read an excerpt. Awake to streetcar and subway, rail yard squeals that continue with cling clangs and oral squalor for long moments on end. It's a whistling as much as it is a dragging and against grade hoisting and an intake of wheezed breath that doesn't stop like a wind that begins to suck the object world into its vortex. And there the cicadas, there the exhaust fan like a box of stomach churn and then late in the game, there the faint voices next door of the parents and babies and the miraculously articulate toddler in mourning discretion, all is set in place, all is buzzing in every direction. I love that, the, the symphony of, of sounds of a neighborhood. Dear Birch, written before the pandemic, anticipates our waiting, our walking and watching, the ways in which we would begin to see and hear the detailed minutiae of place, the ways in which we would walk and walk our streets the way Margaret has done for years. Affect here is in the wind, in the subway cars, in the beeping of a delivery truck, in the cicada coral garland. I come from a Slavic culture that reveres, personifies, and revels in, revels in the natural world. Our poetry often combines nature and revolution, each a metaphor for the other. So I also love that the birch tree speaks, and when she does, we, she, we see that she is bitter and slightly contemptuous, much like my grandmother. All nature is not sweet, and sometimes it turns on us, demanding payback. There is a vein also of the critical in this book, the arms of the state, or a mild yet humorous description of consumption, the timely replacing of older things with newer things. Also the embodied pleasure and complications of queer love. Finally, I appreciate that this book holds space for joy the joy of writing, the joys of nature, but also sorrow. Not that sorrow is joy, but there is, there is something precious to sorrow. With its final, the book's final devastating lines, reminding us of the circularity and constancy of grief and of a daughter's enduring mourning of her mother, which is also an opening comprised of a puzzling, emphatic love. I'm going to read a poem from um, my poetry collection, Halfway to the East, published by Lazara Press. Um, and it's a poem I wrote 20 years ago, written after my grandmother died and after a also puzzling and heartbreaking estrangement that I only later learned was because of my lesbianism. The poem is also set on Ivy Avenue and elegizes the rivers that were once part of Tikaronto, which means the place where the trees are standing in water. These rivers, once a site of nourishment, ritual and travel for the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee were covered over by, settler, by settlers and in this poem, I imagine those rivers connecting back in a gesture that I now see as both colonial and post-colonial with the territory, uh, connecting back with the territory where my grandmother was born. <clears throat> uh, so the poem is called River and it begins with a quote by Toni Morrison from The Site of Memory. All water has perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. Writers are like that, remembering where we were, what valley we ran through, what the banks were like, the light that was there, and the route back to our original place. Uh, so this is the poem. There's a river beneath this street, whispering its watery Babylon from concrete shores Pascal's moving road, Morrison's rush of imagination, 
a river in a hurry to get to where Leslie Street meets Lake Ontario, to lose its man-made embankment, to find itself in the long horizon. There are underground rivers throughout this city, teasing us through sewer grates, their mythic appeal to origin. There are people working to release these rivers as though by doing so, they might find the space that history took from them. I can't stop hearing this river, I know its root, from lines cut into the palms of my grandmother's hands, flowing across St. Lawrence and Atlantic, back to Besna and Dnipro, down to Aral Sea, through Caucasus Mountains, Persian Gulf, Caspian Sea, Indian Ocean, curving back for its long journey across three continents and migrant generations to Don River's industrial sludge. Somewhere my father crossed this river to escape the Nazis. Somehow my Baba traversed that ocean to move into her destiny. Alluvial deposits of memory contain their voices and traces of gesture. Baba's girlish laugh, her half English, half Ukrainian prairie speech. The way my father always wore a hat and kissed the ladies' hands. The river calls their names. Tato, Baba, Father, Grandmother. Last night it rained. Today the river is loud and boisterous. I dreamed my grandmother welcomed me to her home again. I know the river cries with me. And I, I know this is the, I think the fourth anniversary of your mother's passing. And uh, so I, I will also say, as we say in Ukrainian, Vichnaya Pamyat, eternal memory. <clears throat> Thank you, Marzia. We're all so generous. I'm hearing um, the long tone of a cello bow being endlessly moved across a surface. I don't know if that was just something going on in the uh, intercircuitry among us, but uh, that was very palpable for the last two readers. Um, I guess it's back to me. Uh, I want to say what a moving pleasure it is to hear my words on your tongues. I think as poets, perhaps this is a Canadian thing, but we get so little response that we stop asking for it. We stop imagining that poets can think together, that our text can be an intertext, and that through this process, we construct our own activated presence as artists in our culture. Um, so I am both uh, appalled <laughs> at how, uh, how generous you've all been and, and deeply um, joyous about it. Thank you so much. Appalled in the sense that to invite others to speak about oneself is, uh, there's, a, there's a big taboo in our society uh, that, that this, this renders one um, narcissistic. Um, I also just wanted to comment on how, even though several of you did not again, import one of your texts as, an, as, an, as a, pair, a, a pairing or an after response to a critical text, the, the degree to which you imbricated your voice into a text about, uh, it was very moving. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like us now to make some space for uh, the poets, the readers to perhaps speak to each other, speak to each other's piece. Um, and we can take some questions in the chat 
If you have a question that you would like to put to, to the readers, an individual reader or everyone, um, we, we, can, we can talk. Um, so I'll, I'll open that up and uh, let you know that I'll be watching the chat to see if you'd like to, to suggest uh, perhaps strands that interested you in particular. Um, could I ask if uh, Carrie, Sally, Marusia, Lida, or Jim okay, if you if you have anything you'd like to direct at each other? And please feel free to unmute yourself to, to respond. So I have a question to Margaret. I put it in, in, in the chat there. I said, Margaret, how did you come to write Dear Birch in the form that you did with these, like a diary? How did, you, how did that come to you, that form? Uh, the writing was, was narrative prose writing uh, in situ. And as I have done with a variety of texts in the past, uh, after I generated the text over the nine days when I wrote it, about a year later, because there, there was time in letting it be, I returned to it and I, um, I use a counting procedure on narrative prose-based writing to exact a kind of poetic temporality to it. Um, I'm not using enjammed line breaks. I'm not using the sort of lyric craft of the line break. I'm using a kind of counting procedure to intervene on what is otherwise quite a propulsive narrative text. Um, so those are sort of the two stages. The first was a kind of self-writing practice um, that very much was a ritual of memory and presence making in a particular place at a particular time. Um, and the, the sort of return to the text the next year was where I allowed myself to shift it, to deal with gender, to um, let the, the sort of queer uh, identity of my narrative be more present. And, um, and also I, I, wanted to, I wanted to sort of maintain the sense of these texts being dated. Carrie was pointing out this sort of notion of the dated text as was uh, Jumoke going through it as a dated narrative, uh, which is a diaristic practice or a grammar um, that I have used actually ever since I started writing. A lot of my very first book, Not Egypt, published in 1989 is also made of dated diaristic text. So in, in some sense, there was a reaching back through my practice. Um, yeah. Let me scroll down here. So perhaps I'll ask about just this idea of uh, a more conscientious listening practice. I'd be interested to know if that's something that you use in your own art making uh, or citizenship making practices, if uh, listening itself as a, as a form of uh, witness and presence means anything to you in your writing practice. I'd love to hear. Um, anyone speak to that? Maybe I could just say something briefly, Margaret. It's only recently that I have actually become 
conscious of um, um, listening as a practice, something that has been sort of uh, part of the work that I have done over the years as an interpreter, then as a legal worker, documenting narratives. I, I work in refugee law. So a huge uh, part of the work I do is documenting narratives of um, clients, for lack of a better word. And only recently, I uh, it hit me that actually this is a practice that has very much informed my translation and writing, uh, because you you learn how to do turn taking in the in the linguistic sense of the word to wait and to listen to to wait for the person to finish what to finish their thoughts and what they have to say and something I think we rarely see in day-to-day -day, uh, encounters uh, you know there's this constant urge to formulate and voice your thoughts before the other person has had a chance to finish theirs so I think I was fortunate that this came to me as a very pragmatic part of my work and then sort of subconsciously um, uh, informed my translation, literary translation and writing practice. So it's a, it's a gift that I really, I greatly owe to, to the people I have worked with. Um, so this pacing, basically the practice of pacing, mm -hmm. the thoughts and speech. And often ac across languages, multiple languages being present in a space with each having their own metrics and rhythmics and uh, where silence figures differently, I would imagine in different, mm -hmm. different languages as well. Mm -hmm. well. That's fascinating. I can, I can also add to that. Um, when I, I, I began paying attention to the act of listening more when I had to write my novel, a small silence, um, because I had to deal with two characters in a room, a dark room, who, don't, who are aware of the, um, the things around them, but won't allow light into the room. And so um, I would, I remember sometimes I'd actually you know, sit in the dark room and try to figure out what it means to be to listen to the to silence. And so that was one reason why I found, um, I mean, in the in reading Dear Birch, I found it quite fascinating because the other sound, you know, that were just around the city moving, but then there was actually that space to also listen to, um, and listen to the Birch in a way that it, uh, the diary could, you know, it, it would continue day to day. And the engagement of the characters, I haven't employed it in my other writing, like in poetry, it's more always about what the, the visual, what is seen. And then, um, but particularly because in writing the novel, I was also falling back on my work as a poet, you know? So it's kind of like poetry, but it's, it's, it's not, it's prose, but then, one would always have the presence of poetry in, in when when we write when we write um, a novel. Like mm -hmm. I I I I am. Um, it's something that I'm. I want to grow into as because writing the novel itself and engaging that practice um, made me to realize the significance of the things that we do not hear, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that we do not pay attention to, mm -hmm. and how they carry much more, you know, um, one of some of the references I get from people who read it is how much they can hear the things in the room, but there really wasn't, there really, any, there isn't any sound in the room, you know, it's a room that is silent, but people would tell me that they could, they could feel the breath of the, yeah, and it's just the same thing I felt, I could feel that connection when I was reading their verse, you know, um, I could feel the rustling wind 
you know, um, I could feel that sense of sitting and paying attention, like writing to someone who is, who is, who is where the depth of connection is felt in a way that you feel like they are right there in front of you, listening, you know. And it's essential that I hope that I would continue to, you know, nurture that practice. Mm -hmm. oh, that's beautiful, thank you. Listening, oh, oh, I'm oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Listening is a big part of my filmmaking practice. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm doing a, when I'm shooting a documentary film, there's a, there's a, you're listening on so many levels. There's a, a deep listening um, with the subject. I use a kind of ethnographic process where I try to let the interview unfold and try to also allow for silence and um, listen to those silences. But you're also listening to sa the, the, the sound in the room. You have to make sure that, you know, a, a plane or a car doesn't interrupt the, the interview. And there's a wonderful moment at the end of a, of a location shoot where the sound recordist has to record room tone. And so the whole crew sits in silence while room tone is being recorded and um and it's like you're in a group meditation for you know you have to record one or two minutes and forget what it is um so i think that carries over a bit into my writing i i try to think of the soundtrack of of the book or the right the piece um and um you know, and Margaret, you've certainly modeled what a, how a soundtrack can operate within a poem. I think mm. of it as a, as a soundtrack. Mm. Um, so yeah, interesting to think about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sarah Jarvis has a question here on the chat. So let me share this with everyone and see if uh, you'd like to respond. Listening to this unique practice feels like a chorus of voices singing theme and variations. Margaret mentioned the cello too, which might maybe was just in my own head, but I think it was there. Would one or two of the presenters like to comment on this synchronicity of women's voices? Well, I think that we don't get to be synchronous very often. Mm -hmm. So it's a rare and pleasurable opportunity. We're often pitted against one another or we pit ourselves against one another. Mm -hmm. um, we become institutionally um, siloed if we're working in institutions. So um, I think it's a kind of a rare a rare kind of uh, synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess it makes me think a little bit about uh, just the idea of synchronicity makes me think about simultaneity. So not necessarily patterns that repeat in linear time or cycles that repeat, but uh, the multitude of experiences and perceptions that are happening at the same time. Um, and I guess one of the pieces of the text is to um, write into a bisexual sensibility of my own you know, sort of multiple um, being simultaneous. Uh, listen, this is also a kind of simultaneous listening uh, and voicing at the same time, but um, sexuality is a place where where the, the sort of multiplicity and simultaneity occur, which can be hard to do in a text because text tends to make us organize our thoughts into linear 
time. I mean, a lot about, a lot of the poem is moving time, you know, in moving, moving, moving time. <laughs> um, I it's, it's very interesting. The cello keeps coming in and out. <laughs> it's almost a beacon. Um, Carrie, I'm wondering about uh, photography and silence and perhaps the, I mean, you, you've been working on themes of mourning uh, also in relation to, to mother loss. Um, but one of, your, one of your major practices is photography. And I, I wonder alongside our discussion of translation mm. and film and poetry, if photography has other uh, shimmers of, of listening in it for you. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I was, you know that so much of what I write is prose and is about sort of other people's art. So when that question came up about listening, I was I was thinking, I never do that. I never write sort of the sounds around me. Um, I'm always writing about a photograph or about a film or something, or almost always. I mean, there was the listening to Dear Birch, um, but that was different. It's not the sounds around me. But as you say that about the visual, I feel like um, I feel like my photography practice is a little bit like you know your diaristic recording and you know what I do on Instagram, the way that I um, you know walk around the neighborhood pictures that I take on my iPhone, I think are my way of, of visual listening. Um, and I mean, it's literally recording, but mm -hmm. that's, um, and the, I mean, the connection to poetry and fragmentation. And, you know, I think my, my, a lot of my photographs are more poetic than any of my writing, if that makes sense, because I'm so often writing whatever articles for magazines and newspapers that I feel like my poetry is in um, is in the image, uh, which is why I get really excited and nervous to do something like tonight, because I always, I'm like, I'm not a poet. I'm something else. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I feel a little bit like an imposter in a room of poets because it's not my, it's not my genre. And yet your poetics ripple in so many directions. So, um, I think we, we all understand the way we end up categorizing our work. I, I think I'm attracted to all of you because of the interdisciplinarity. Mm. Um, Sally, you know, perhaps your memoir project is, I mean, we, we haven't really talked that much about memoir, but um, your project certainly involved immense uh, kinds of listening, I would imagine. Would you like to speak to that in relation to uh, the Emperor's Orphans? Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. I, I mean, I wrote a memoir and I actually thought the least important uh, part of writing the memoir was myself because I really wanted it to be about my family and the different things that they went through. But more and more as I developed the story, I realized that it was also, their story was actually my story too. And I needed to tell the story of myself uh, to the reader too. So, um, it's funny because I, 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 I think to be, I want to be self-effacing. It's not, it's not about me. It shouldn't be about me. But why am I writing it though, <laughs> right? Uh, so, um, so I think it was uh, examining their stories, listening to their stories informed me of who I was. Um, and um, and I, 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 I think, uh, I think, yeah, I think I always wanted to listen, but didn't want to, um, didn't want me, to, me, the me that was doing the listening, to be part of that listening somehow. Does it, that sounds paradoxical, but you know, because you're afraid of that whole narcissistic thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a story that I felt, and I actually felt my own story wasn't that interesting. Mm -hmm. But you know, in the end, I'm the one that's crafting it with words. So, uh, yeah, there, there, there's the part of it that's the crafting, and uh, the crafting of it with words is is what mm -hmm. is also making who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, as a person too, you know, so, yeah. Beautiful. Well, I think we're just about at the end of our 
allotted hour and a half. Um, there was one other note from Penny Goldsmith from out west. What is the story behind the August 27th sans serif? That was a poem that was imported from uh, another, another era of my, my maternal life. Um, that's a poem about, um, about mothering, the, how hard mothering is. And it, um, it, it fell in, in the timeline, um, again, because so much of my work through the years has been dated, I recognize that, you know, that's what I was doing in 2009 on um, whatever it was, August, um, I forget the specific date, 25th. Um, so I wanted to make a fold and have that simultaneity of relationality uh, in the in the in that sort of uh, I guess that's a, a metaphor of memory, you know, that all of those conjunctions. In this case, it was sitting near a body of water and the kids going ballistic and listen how hard it is to listen to that, how hard it is to to hold and be with and stay with that degree of um, uh, children dissembling. Um, and which is the self dissembling um, and, and recuperating and, and going on, on with it. Um, so this whole idea of ongoingness, um, I thought it was an interesting way to incorporate the past. Um, well, I really would like to extend uh, a lot of thanks to everyone for coming. Um, the audience who, if you haven't spoken, um, I have listened to you this entire time. Your presence has been really, really important. And um, I want to invite other poets who are part of this evening to throw your own poetry parties. I think it works out pretty well. Um, we're all a pretty generous bunch, I think. And um, it is, it's, it's kind of revelatory to even feel read. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, for being with us. Um, at a certain point earlier in the evening, she mentioned that there was a big storm coming through Windsor and we might lose power. Um, so <laughs> uh, we, we avoided the storm and um, I look forward to, uh, to, to seeing you all in other circumstances, but thank you for sharing this pandemic uh, round table together. I really appreciate it. So we'll say good night and uh, this will be online um, as, a, as a kind of, you know, living uh, text of uh, the critical reception of my work, but also your voices uh, responding to poetry. Thanks a lot. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Enjoy Thank your you. evening. Thanks all. <laughs> Thank you. So nice to see everyone. I'll let you guys take a quick look through the um, chat if you want. Everyone saying thank you and goodbye. Oh, and thanks for board. board. <laughs> thank you. Really Before like I go, I want to show everybody this this birch that I peeled oh. off, this, <laughs> off this tree that I, when I was thinking about you this weekend and this event, I thought, oh. Look at this. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> I hope you write on it. Yeah, I do. I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, bye, everyone. Actually, as 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 the audience leaves, we can we if you want to stop the recording. I think you already did, sure. right?